we reached peak law book in 1998. So I started law school in the fall of 1999. One of the very first things that we had to do at law school was complete a library research assignment. So we were given multiple questions. We had to go into the stacks, roam around, find the, the correct thick leather bound volumes to answer the questions in the assignment. And it and really was it paper chase. We had to chase from stack to stack, find the cross references. And it took several hours to get through this. And we were all fighting for largely the same volumes and you know, fighting over these books. Two weeks later, I found myself in the basement of the same law school library in the computer lab, 20 computers. So I was with 19 of my colleagues in the law school class. And completely independently of this research assignment, we were being instructed how to use online legal research tools to answer largely the same questions using an online system. And my mind was blown. It was so much easier to find what we were looking for than chasing through the stacks, fighting over, you know, books. But I'm not here to dump on the book or say that the book is a terrible thing. Of course, the book is an amazing invention. If you think back to Gutenberg's printing press, in 1440 and the combination of that with movable type and what ensued in the following six centuries, it's actually phenomenal, right? Originally, millions of Bibles were produced, mass produced using the printing press. That led to things like the Protestant Reformation, the Counter-Reformation, the Council of Trent, um, but eventually led to significant uh, progress in the arts and science, dissemination of progress in the arts and sciences led to the Enlightenment, led to the Industrial Revolution, led to public libraries, led to public education, led to reforms to the way in which we govern ourselves, led to very significant political changes, led to on and on and on, right up to the present, a very complicated modern nation state who has, a, and we, we have as its, one of its key infrastructure elements, the legal system. Now, if we zoom in on the legal system and the role that the book has played in the legal system, it's equally compelling. So think about the legal system in the absence of printed books. It's really, it's hard to think of. We have oral traditions. Before that, we would have had, um, you know, rules that were handwritten um, prior to the development of the book. But what the book made possible is the common law. So case reporters were some of the earliest books produced and just publication of what the courts are actually doing. That led to things like secondary materials like commentaries on the laws of England by Blackstone, an incredible scholarly effort going through and reading hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of judgments of the courts, the common law courts in England and compiling what it actually meant for the legal system in trying to draw out categories and identify trends in the case law. Subsequent to that, of course, we have the publication of lots of primary material, statutes, regulations, and the publication of all of these materials allowed for the emergence of the modern law school, led to the emergence of a thriving scholarly enterprise of critiquing the laws, commenting on the normative desirability of the laws, led to everything that we now take for granted as part of the legal infrastructure that led to the modern regulatory state. All of this is because of the book. Now, I teach tax law. Tax law is my specialty. So I'm going to use tax as an example of why we've reached the end of the line, not completely, but largely the end of the line for the book in law. So think about April every year. In April every year, I experience a pang of apprehension when I'm confronted with this little check box that says, are you sure that your tax return is accurate and complete? And I experience this pang of apprehension because I know it's almost impossible for me to be certain that it's accurate and complete. Why? Well, I'm too acutely aware of how much material I would need to comprehend in order to make that claim with 99% Confident. In fact, I'm really confident that I'm introducing some kind of mistake uh, into my return when I when I check that when I check that checkbox. And so, what I take comfort in is it says to the best of my knowledge. Well, to the best of my knowledge, okay, that's fine. 
and to the tax authorities, it really is to the best of my knowledge. If you're watching this, um, don't, <laughs> don't come after me. Um, but the, the, real, the reason why it's so hard to make sure that I'm actually getting it right is because the materials are so voluminous, right? I, no one can work through the tens of thousands of cases that have come through the courts in tax law. No one can read through the entire statute. No one can read through the regulations. No one can even get into the administrative treatment of all of those things. It's just life is too short. You have to move on. You have to complete your tax return and get back to daily living. So that's, that's just true. And so the solution to too much printed material relating to tax is not to print more material relating to tax, hence the catch-22, right? So, so what do we do? And the answer lies in artificial intelligence and machine learning, lies in legal technology. And so, you know, the book has been fantastic. It's led to enormous economic growth, political development, social development, scientific progress, um, but there are limitations to the book in law. And so how is legal tech going to be influenced by the computer? Well, I see it unfolding in five stages. Stage one started in the 1960s, 1970s, with the digitization of a lot of materials that used to be in books. So just a straight up translation from these analog paper-based materials to digital copies of those materials and making it available in digital format. Stage two involves, and it's stage one is still ongoing, by the way, so there are huge projects digitizing the past repository of primary and secondary literature in law. It's still ongoing. We'll catch up soon. Uh, and a lot of the most recent stuff is available natively in, in digital formats. Stage two involves what I would call networking or um, cross-referencing. So indexing all of this stuff, making it searchable, and making it accessible from anywhere on earth. So now there are uh, commercial publishers, there are nonprofit organizations that are dedicated to making this comprehensive legal information available from anywhere on earth using an internet connection and really fantastic initiatives are ongoing. But so far at stage one, the digitalization, and stage two, the networking and making it available from anywhere are relatively uncreative in what they're doing with this legal information. Why? Because we're taking stuff that used to be on paper and put it on a screen. And yes, you can find it more quickly, and yes, you can find it from anywhere, but it's relatively uncreative. So what gets me really excited is what's happening at stage three, and what's starting to happen at stage three in the work that we're doing in Toronto is synthesizing the contents of these big databases of digital legal information to figure out what happens in new circumstances. So we're using machine learning and artificial intelligence to train algorithms on what courts will do in new situations. And we're able to do that with up to 94% accuracy in novel situations. And that compares with what lawyers are able to do with conventional legal training, and that's in most circumstances between 60 and 70% accurate. So these algorithms have the benefit of being able to look at every case decided on a particular legal issue and use that to guide predictions about what courts will do in the very next case. So it's a very, very powerful approach to predicting legal outcomes. And so over the next several years, maybe decades, what will happen is this is going to happen in every area of the law. So far we started in tax law, and in employment law. Um, but in principle, there's no reason why we have to stop there. And in fact, our vision is to bring absolute clarity to every area of the law, uh, everywhere and on demand. So there should be no boundaries, geographical, um, with respect to different legal systems. We should be able to bring clarity to all the areas of law using AI and machine learning. If a human can, in principle, do it, then I think a machine learning algorithm can be taught to do the same thing. Now, this leads to stage four and stage five. And so stage four involves what, what I kind of think of as a hangover of sorts. So imagine you throw a really raucous house party and you have a great time, you pass out, it's your house, you pass out, you wake up the next morning and you look around and in the light of day, everything's a complete mess. I think that's very likely to happen when we start having a mature stage three of legal technology, we will look around and go, did, did anyone know that this, this is the pattern of consequences associated with our current legal system? Did anyone actually realize that things are as messy as they actually are? And I think it's going to kick off a very serious look at law reform in a, in a number of dimensions. And they're going to be difficult political 
conversations, a lot of normative work for folks like me who are law professors who are meant to, you know, commentate and, and guide the development of the law, um, but pitch political battles over the content of the law. So that, that will happen, and there will be significant changes, I suspect, to our political and legal institutions as a result of that. Stage five gets us into sci-fi territory, and I think it leads us to self-driving laws or the legal singularity, where actually legal uncertainty is largely eliminated. So 99% of legal uncertainty is eliminated. Do you realize that every year there are 18 million lawsuits filed in the United States? It's a lot of litigation. And a lawsuit emerges when two parties have different attitudes or beliefs about what's likely to happen if something's going to go to court. If we have almost completely eliminated legal uncertainty, a lot of that litigation is superfluous. You don't need litigation if the answer is very predictable. And that's where all of this is going. And so uh, I'll leave you with two thoughts, and both of them relate to what you're going to be doing next April. Uh, the first is as you confront that checkbox and think, oh, I, now I feel this pang of apprehension, number one, you're not alone in that apprehension. Even those who are experts in tax feel that pang of apprehension when they're signing off on their tax return. And number two, the law is becoming more transparent, more accessible, uh, more fair, more just, and it's happening right now uh, in Toronto, and it's coming soon around the world. Thank you very much.